Greetings to everyone. Good morning. Okay, one moment. Good morning, good morning. Okay, I'm going to do the general greeting and acknowledgement of all the persons. And then after that, we'll move in right into a greeting. So from our Venezuelan representative here, that is the Charge d'Affaires of the Venezuelan Embassy here in Jamaica. Okay, so please stay tuned. Madam Presenter Charlene Wilkinson, lecturer in the Department of Modern Languages at the University of Guyana, Charge d'Affaires of the Venezuelan Embassy in Jamaica, Senor Jose Antonio, Madam Mirtha Desulme, President of the Haiti Jamaica Society, Monsieur Fred Renault, lecturer in the Department of Politics and International Relations from the University based on T. de la Guyenne in Guadeloupe. Mr. Vivian Crawford, Executive Director of the Institute of Jamaica. Mrs. Patrick Shaw, Deputy Director of the Institute of Jamaica. Mrs. Jacqueline Boucher, Director of the Programs Coordination Division of the Institute of Jamaica. Colleagues from the Institute as well. Friends, well-wishers joining us here today. Welcome. Welcome to this, our 206th anniversary of the Carta de Amaica, written by Simon Bolivar. Today, we will be celebrating this by having a conversation. We decided to call it a conversation because we want a sort of participatory uh, seminar where you can also air your views, not just uh, in the form of a lecture where you would listen but not be able to participate. So we've set up this uh, meeting in such a way that you can also participate by airing your views. We want to thank each of you for taking the time to be here with us today and to share with us in this our virtual event. Uh, just uh, at this point, I'd like to move right into the greetings which will be brought to us by Senor Jose Antonio Sanchez, Charge oh, Affairs of the Venezuelan Embassy in Jamaica. Bienvenido, Senor. Uh, muy buenos días. No sé si me están escuchando bien. Are you listening? Yes, we're hearing you. Can you listen? All right. Um, buenos días a todos. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to start um, saying thank you from the Embassy of Venezuela in Jamaica. Um, in the commemoration, in the celebration of the 206th anniversary of the Letter of Jamaica. Um, I would like to recognize the presence of uh, Mr. Vivian Crawford, the director of the Institute of Jamaica. Also recognize the presence of uh, Mrs. Jacqueline Bouchai, director, uh, programs division of the Institute of Jamaica, and the rest of the uh, members of the Institute. Um, I would also like to say um, uh, greetings to Lady uh, Mrs. Charlene Wilkinson, um, the lecturer in the Department of Languages and Cultural Studies of the University of Guyana. And of course, recognize and thanks once again um, for uh, Mrs. Um, Ms. Nadine Booth Gooden, the center manager of the Simon Bolivar Cultural Center. Um, Many thanks and well, friends all, good morning, everyone. I, I have the pleasure to address um, some words in the occasion of the celebration of the 206th anniversary of the Letter of Jamaica. On behalf of the government of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and its people and the Embassy of Venezuela in Jamaica, I offer you warm, warm greetings and at the same time I say happy anniversary to the Letter of Jamaica. 
I will always recommend consulting the geography in order to understand the geopolitics. Most of the different historical processes that took place within this strategic region have to do with geography. And without a doubt, the great liberator of the Americas, Simon Bolivar, was one of the first visionaries in the Americas geopolitics of what he described and dreamed as the union of the Latin American and the Caribbean region. The famous Carta de Jamaica, or Letter of Jamaica, was a clear document where he could provide his vision. In Kingston remain the footprints of the great liberator Simon Bolivar. All of us are witness of where Bolivar took the inspiration to write the, fam the famous Letter of Jamaica, that history will later recognize what, as one of the most famous documents written by Bolivar regarding the integration and the union of our Latin America and Caribbean countries. Bolivar lived in Kingston from May to December 1815. Yeah. Uh, in Kingston, in Jamaica, he found inspiration despite that, the difficulties to express his vision of the union of the people from the south of, of Rio Grande to Patagonia, including the Caribbean. History knows that famous document as the letter of Jamaica, La Carta de Jamaica. Back then, the British leadership on the island underestimated his capacity and turned its, its backs on him without knowing that the liberator will move to Haiti, where he did get the human and logistical support to continue his fight for the freedom of our territories from the Spanish Empire. Please let me quickly refer to that prominent document. And I quote, it is a grandiose idea to think of consolidating the new world into a single nation, united by, by parts into a single bond. It is reason that as these parts have a common origin, language, custom, and religion, they ought to have a single government to permit the newly formed states to unite in a confederation. But this is not possible. Actually, America is separated by climate, def climate differences, geographic diversity, conflicting interests, and dissimilar characteristics. How beautiful it would be to, if the Isthmus of Panama could be for us what the Isthmus of Corinth was for the Greeks. I shall, I shall tell you with what we must provide ourselves in order to expel the Spaniards and to found free government is the union, obviously. But such union will come about through sensible planning and well-directed actions rather than by divine magic. Simon Bolivar uh, visualized this territory as a uh, one piece of land, the real union of the Latin America and the Caribbean. Also in this heroic path of the struggle from freedom and independence of this great continent, Commander Hugo Chavez was a famous follower of the line of thought. For more than a decade, Chavez spread to different regions of the world, as our liberator did more than 200 years ago, raising the flags of independence, freedom, peace, and social justice. Chavez showed great affection to our regions, toward Latin America and the Caribbean. Even the history of this cultural center is considered a testimony of the old friendship between Venezuela and Jamaica. We have to remember that Commander Hugo Chavez, when visit Jamaica back in 1999, he asked the persons who were providing security and assistance to him to take him to the streets of downtown in Kingston, where Bolivar lived. He asked if there was any place in the city that would keep or preserve the historical trees of Simon Bolivar while he lived in Jamaica from May to December, 1815. That's when Chavez proposed to the people and the government of Jamaica in that time that the need of to build a place to visualize and conserve his path through his beautiful, to this beautiful country. Yes, dear friends, this play has a great meaning for the people and the government of Venezuela. Feel yourself proud of having the opportunity of being part of the ama amazing cultural center. Once again, we will like to thank and recognize the support and coordination of the Institute of Jamaica and the support in helping the people of Jamaica to, act, to have access to learn about our history, language, and culture. 
Let's keep on moving. Let's keep on working hard and building our own destiny based in the union, cooperation, and solidarity. And speaking of languages, please let me refer to Mr. Nelson Mandela. And I quote, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his own language, that goes to his heart. In the name of Venezuela, we say, vivan los 206 años de la Carta de Jamaica. Viva el libertador Simón Bolívar. Vivan los pueblos de Venezuela y Jamaica. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Ah, señor. Sanchez, thank you very much. Long live the Carta de Jamaica. Long live the Venezuelan people. Long live the Jamaican people. That were, um, those were your final remarks. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Okay. That was a very informative presentation. We would like to, at this time, move right into our presenter of the morning, Madame Charlene Wilkinson, lecturer in the Department of Modern Languages at the University of Guyana. Greetings again to everyone. Good morning. Good. I'm humbled and honored to be asked to open this conversation with you. And I do trust that I live up to the confidence placed in me by my colleague in activism, Mirtha Desolme, who recommended me to Mrs. Booth Gooden. Firstly, I wish to ensure that you do not mistake me to be an expert in linguistics or in the social and economic history of Latin America and the Caribbean. I come to you as an ordinary English teacher whose primary concern for more than three decades now has been how schools help to shape the consciousness of our children. And I therefore thank the Institute of Jamaica for giving an ordinary teacher a voice outside of the classroom because so few of us ever get the opportunity to speak about matters crucially related to the concerns of the profession, except within the confines of narrow administrative echo chambers. My first assumption in making this presentation is to take the term integration in the topic to mean political integration, a process which would engender a bond that strengthens the individual nations within the regional body, thereby increasing the sense of security and cultural confidence of all the peoples of these nations equally with no special privilege to any and no discrimination against any. In respect of the role of language, it would therefore be necessary to understand what linguistic integration means. The Charter on Language Policy and Language Rights in the Creole-speaking Caribbean considers that persons who move to and settle in the territory of another language community have the right and duty to maintain an attitude of integration towards this community. This term, integration, is understood to mean an additional socialization of such persons in such a way that they may preserve their original linguistic and cultural characteristics while sharing with the society in which they have settled sufficient references, values, and forms of behavior in linguistic and other areas to enable them to function socially without greater difficulties than those experienced by members of the host community. The Charter identifies integration as desirable and the complete opposite of assimilation. Assimilation means acculturation in the host society in such a way that the original cultural characteristics are replaced by references, values, and forms of behavior of the host society. The ethics of the charter forbid such an acculturation to be forced or induced and insists that it can only be the result of an entirely free choice. My second assumption, therefore, 
is that we can agree that our political, cultural, and linguistic freedoms are currently grossly compromised by the current arrangements of the world economy. According to the latest United Nations estimates, the current population of Latin America and the Caribbean is approximately 661 million. The Caribbean community grouping with its 15 member states and scores of indigenous and modern Caribbean languages has only six official languages, English, French, Dutch, Spanish, Haitian, and Papiamento. The CARICOM website is entirely in English, except for the revised Treaty of Chago Ramos, which gives four language options for accessing the articles of the treaty, English, French, Dutch, and Spanish. For the countries of Latin America, Spanish is the sole official language with Portuguese for Brazil. Professor Shona Jackson reminds us of the hundreds of indigenous peoples in Central and South America, with the 240 of those peoples in Brazil alone. Of the mainland Caribbean countries, Belize has several Maya groups. There are also the descendants of enslaved Africans who intermarried with Arawakan peoples, the Garifuna being one such group with a large diaspora. French Guyana has seven indigenous groups and three Maroon groups, and Suriname has four indigenous and six Maroon groups. In Dominica, there is the Kalinago, and in Trinidad, the Carib descendants still maintain visible community, and I have omitted many others. The number of languages currently spoken in Latin America is estimated by a World Bank study to be 560. But prior to the arrival of Columbus, more than 2,000 languages were spoken in the region. Today, only four of the dominant language families are considered to be not endangered. Quechua, with 9 million speakers, Aymara, 2.2 million speakers, Guarani, 5 million speakers, and Nahuatl or Aztec, 1.5 million. Robertson aptly describes the Caribbean and Latin American space as a graveyard for languages. Devonish, while recounting the slaughter of languages through genocide in the Columbus era, warns that although the widespread slaughter of people is no longer fashionable, the tactics of linguicide through hostile language policies have the same end result the extinction of languages. He points out, one explanation for the endangerment of indigenous languages is the need felt by members of the indigenous communities to engage with the wider society. They have to do so via either the official languages of the respective countries, English, Dutch, Portuguese, or Spanish, and or the Creole vernacular language widely used in the country. At first, this leads to transitional bilingualism at the community level. Almost inevitably, in two or three generations, however, the external language replaces the indigenous language as the medium of communication within the community. In Guyana, we see this in the case of Warao and Lokono, especially since the members of those groups migrate to the coastland and intermix with the non-indigenous Guyanese. And Scott Napkangas chides us for not remembering that there are deaf people in all societies. And while hearing people have developed spoken oral languages, the deaf have developed sign languages, full-fledged complex abstract languages. And she adds that those who speak about languages, but in fact mean oral languages only, participate through invisibilizing sign languages in killing half the linguistic diversity on earth. The UN Declaration of 2019 as the International Year of Indigenous Languages and the Decade coming 2020 to 32 as the international decade of indigenous languages is a well-needed show of concern for this 
endangerment. I am from Guyana, which has a modern Caribbean language, Creolese as a lingua franca, along with nine endangered indigenous languages, three of which are severely endangered. In the current geopolitical situation, English still remains the only official language of Guyana, even though it is not a mother tongue for the great majority of Guyanese. As a Guyanese who has traveled quite a bit within my country, I'm conscious of a vast and very geographical landscape. 83,000 square miles, about 215 square kilometers, but a very small population, less than 1 million. I still like to remind my Caribbean friends and associates that in terms of sheer area, Guyana can hold 19 Jamaicas or seven Haitis, and there are 366 islands in the mouth of one of our three great rivers, the Essequibo, and one of those islands is larger than Barbados. My sense of belonging to the land is primarily emotional and cultivated. As I dwell in a cultural genetic space bequeathed in part by transported enslaved Africans, migrant Chinese and Portuguese, indentured Indians, and the British colonist enslaver. And in part by my own sovereign imagination. Thank you, George Lamy. Like almost 90% of Guyanese, I am therefore not native to the land in the way the 10% indigenous Guyanese are native. I speak Creolese and English and can read a little French. These few facts outline my particularity, but there is a sense in which I represent all Caribbean and Latin American people in that we are all faced with two ontological questions. Are we settlers to this space? or are we natives? Thank you again, Professor Shona Jackson. In respect of the languages of Latin America and the Caribbean, the answers to these two questions highlight the power relations between language users and evoke the history of subjugation and violence that explains why some languages are official and highly valued, highly audible and codified, taught in schools, used for all the publications of the institutions of the state, while some are vernacular, relegated to cultural events, little valued in the economic sense, endangered, and even on the brink of extinction. In Guyana, local politics sets the inheritors of the plantation against each other, in competition with an econo within an economic system controlled by the inheritors of the former slave masters. I have no doubt that similar power relations play out everywhere else in the region, except perhaps in Cuba and in the Chiapas region where the Zapatista revolution took place, but I would be open to correction. To further intensify our national angst, the geopolitics of the current world order with a great oil find, rendering Guyana one of the potentially richest nations on the globe, our next door neighbor, Venezuela, with its 28 and a half million people to our less than 1 million, plus its 916 plus thousand square kilometers to our 215,000, is stoking the fires of a 200 year old territorial dispute with Guyana, claiming almost two thirds of the space we currently call Guyana. The US State Department, in collaboration with the oil giant ExxonMobil, currently has a visible presence in what many call a recolonized Guyana and has set up a show of support systems inclusive of teaching American English to Venezuelan refugees, fleeing a country in political and economic turmoil exacerbated by the currently hostile policies of the US towards it. On the ground in Guyana, however, the Guyanese and with um, small migrant entrepreneurs, Brazilians, Cubans, and now Venezuelans compete with each other and with the Guyanese with little or no support systems from their respective states.
And the sordid joke in the thoroughfare is that even in prostitution, the non-Guyanese are in competition with the Guyanese. The settler ontology then, still very much the colonizer, the extractor, the taker, the destroyer of diversity, the economic competitor, preoccupies us with concepts of sovereignty that traps our consciousness within an ideology of national borders whose creation we had nothing to do with in the first place. Put solemn faces on our political leaders, forcing hypocritical speeches, placing their histories as beginning with the European plantations and making invisible and inaudible the indigenous ontologies. Discriminatory migration policies, applying legalities designed by the original invader, pit the wretched of the earth, thank you, Franz Fanon, against each other, triumphing when their systems push back against the puerile efforts of regional bodies like CARICOM to even imagine any notion of economic independence. The indigenous ontology, on the other hand, is preoccupied with relating to a more ancient territorial sovereignty, with keeping alive indigenous knowledges of crops and farming techniques, trading patterns of medicine and healing, modes of relationship, modes of living in community, with a struggle to be heard and valued by the dominant settler society and its plantation ideologies and to keep its languages alive against the eclipsing monoculture of the current world economy. My third assumption this morning is that you would agree with me that in celebrating Simone Bolivar's Jamaica letter, we are celebrating an abiding spirit within our species, regardless of race, regardless of geographical or linguistic borders, regardless of that particular human failing that seems perpetually to lead us to the misuse of power. A spirit that affirms joy and freedom and the sanctity of being human and self-actualizing and self-creating. Bolivar, in spite of his own lingering colonial tendencies, as evident in the letter itself, where, for example, he saw the European as the civilizing presence and the indigenous Caribbean and Latin Americans as needing to be civilized, still represents that indomitable human spirit determined to resist oppression and conquest at all costs. So, is there a justifiable reason for us to consciously give language a role in our efforts to politically integrate this region? The topic itself is contentious. The role of language in the integration of Latin America and the Caribbean. And the topic threatens to fly in the face of that very spirit of self-actualization and self-creation. If one thinks of an integration, creating consciousness as one which strives to make a functioning whole out of our disparate, mutually incomprehensible, disorderly, unpredictably, and wildly beautiful multilingual inheritance. Vandana Shiva, the Indian scholar, environmental activist, and author, rightly to my mind, accuses Bill Gates of being a digital dictator who thinks that life is like a word program that can be chopped and cut and pasted, and I'm quoting her, when it is an amazingly complex self-organization that scientists call autopoesis. Life, like language, is that human possession that is forever self-organizing into a future as it connects its countless users to their distinct inheritances, their distinct collective memories and experiences. And when we think of the cultural and linguistic space mapped onto the daunting but breathtaking geography of Latin America and the Caribbean, the question of the role of language in integration seems one only the foolhardy would ask. Could you let in my friend Claymont Chung into the waiting room? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, the question of the role of language in integration seems to be one only the foolhardy might ask. 
Language is that unique possession of our species, a possession that sets us apart from other created beings. It might be said to be the unique way our species has to self-actualize and self-create. And so I might have tricked you by not offering a blueprint. And I now open the conversation and I'm anxious to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilkinson, Charlie Wilkinson. As we mentioned before, lecturer in the Department of Modern Languages at the University of Guyana. Thank you very much for that very insightful presentation. It was quite informative. I certainly had quite a few moments there when I had a little eye opening, like, oh, I didn't know that. And I'm sure our attendees share that, 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 that view as well. Now, at this time, we would like to invite anyone here from our, our, our list of invitees to give a feedback on either directly on what Ms. Ms. Wilkinson has presented or your perspective on this. Since we have doubled the conversation, we are opening the floor at this time for your feedback on the topic, the role of language in the integration of Latin America and the Caribbean. While you get ready to speak, uh, I would like to just add the fact that, or comment on the fact that usually we, 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 would, we, would, we would imagine that this is a conversation that it has been going on for so long and everything has been said about it that can be said. But the more you listen to various speakers from various backgrounds, you begin to understand what a conundrum it is in and of itself. It's not something that will be fixed or solved or addressed with just a click of one button or even the pulling of some curtains where you can seek to hide some things, obscure some things that they would say and highlight others. So it is indeed a conversation that must continue. And in continuing this conversation, we do hope that we have more, more opportunity to see from different angles and to learn more about even the way in which we interact with each other. I'm looking out for anyone who's willing to comment at this time. Um. I didn't, can I speak French? <laughs> Pardon me, Monsieur Renault? Can I speak French? Ah. If you do, you would have to speak very slowly. <laughs> very slowly. And I, I might miss. Okay, I, I try. I try. Monsieur Renault, you can speak English well enough. You can maybe try to speak. I can speak English. <laughs> yes, I, know. I can try if you want. So I can, I can try. I can try to speak English. So um, th thank you for, for, for your presentation. So, um, as you know, I, I come from a, a, a French territory. Uh, so uh, the role of languages uh, in uh, the process of integration means for me uh, the role of languages at two levels, the national level and the regional level. So, um, at national level, uh, as you uh, show it in your country, like uh, French Guiana, uh, there are many languages. Uh, so uh, it means that language is uh, uh, also um, the translation of, uh, of, of, of relation of power. So my, 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 my first question is about uh, what, what, uh, what uh, relation you, you, you do between uh, politics and, and language. Because in, in, in French Guiana, for example, um, the Creole, the, the, the group we call Creole, uh, speak, speaks French and Creole. And these two languages 
are dominant languages. So uh, when I speak of uh, language, uh, I mean to politics, or, or politic or politics, because we, we have to, 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 to have a politics uh, uh, of, of language too. Uh, so um, how do you do to respect uh, equality between uh, these uh, groups? Uh, how do you do to manage uh, the relation of, of, of power, finally? Right, right. Uh, your question is the $64 million question, as you can see. <laughs> And, and the wise person, the wise person would stay far away from trying to manage. But you know, given the tendency to power in our world, and those whose tendencies to power is stronger than others, we always seem to end up, as I said, I don't know if the species will ever change. Um, we always seem to end up with imbalances of power and that translates into imbalances of language use as well, where those who possess a certain language impose themselves and their institutions upon the others, the weaker or the groups who are not as armed as they are to, to resist. So the question is, or I suppose we could we could assume that we must therefore step into the free. We can't just leave the beautiful, the beautiful autopoiesis to live on its own because of the very, our very human nature seems to, to, to present a problem of inequity. This is how I see it. I mean, I'm open to, to contestation. So we therefore have to create legal and political systems that help us to work out policies that move us closer and closer to equality and balance. And the image I'd like to bring to mind is the, the image of, an, of a biological ecosystem. Because when we talk about the death or the slaughter of human beings through genocide, and which comes along with the death of the languages, we can compare it to the slaughter of a biological ecosystem. And linguists are also arguing that when you slaughter languages, you slaughter not only the linguistic ecosystem, but it interferes with biological ecosystems as well, because human beings having to live in harmony with the environment need their languages to help them to do this. Because as I said, the uniqueness of the human species is that we alone have this thing called language. No other created being, as far as we know, in, the, in our universe has language. So the idea then is to keep working at language policy and language policy that always involves the greater number of people helping to craft it. That, that is the answer to your question. I don't know if it's too simplistic an answer. Did you understand okay. or did I talk too fast? Yes, yes, yes. no, it's okay. Merci. <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, Senor, Senor Sanchez, would you like to give a feedback on that? From your point of view? It, it's fine for me. Okay. All right. Okay, so I would take the opportunity at this time to raise a point that uh, Monsieur Renault brought to my attention a few months ago, I think it was in May when we were preparing for the celebration of the uh, arrival of Simon Bolivar in Jamaica. He brought to my attention that very often, based on some surveys that have been done, when we, we ask uh, Jamaican students, for example, even university students, what they know of Guadeloupe, for example. It's as if they've never heard of that place, most of them. And the reverse is quite true. When you ask the Guadeloupeans what they know about the Jamaican uh, history, they, they are not aware of it either. And I believe there is also a part of it that we have to look at. When you talk about the political 
uh, framework and policies and all that that has to facilitate this whole integration process. Travel is one of the main things that facilitate that. I remember when I was living in Guadeloupe, uh, I had to overnight in Antigua and take another plane to some place before I can't get a direct flight to Guadeloupe, for example. And where you don't have ready, red, you don't have transportation readily available to link territories or regions, you find that the, either it, between trade, language, uh, education, uh, music, whatever other cultural exchange becomes difficult. People want, you see how easy it is for us to jump on an airplane and go to Miami, for example. You have direct flights daily. So it's no, and to North America. So it's no surprise that such culture is pervasive within, I would say now the Caribbean region and even in the Latin American region as well, because places that are easily accessible to you. And even when you don't go there readily, we have right here in Jamaica, many North American cable stations. We don't have any Guadalupe station here to bring into our homes this experience. So that is also a part then I think that's a major part of what keeps people uh, on the outskirts of other re making relationship within the Caribbean and across Latin America. We also know that we have, a, I would think, a language phobia in Jamaica. When you start speaking, uh, as a matter of fact, I have been speaking Japanese and people accuse me of speaking Spanish, for example. Once someone does not understand what you're saying, they say, oh, Nadine, you're talking to Spanish again when that's not even Spanish, but that's to show you how far removed you are from it. Although we do it in school at some level, most of us would have been exposed to Spanish, but you would imagine someone is speaking Japanese and you can still confuse it for Spanish. That is to show you, we don't have enough cultural programs of exchange or you know, to, to cause the regions to interact. And, and as I said before, transportation helps to facilitate that. If it's so difficult and so expensive to reach another island that is so close to you, then of course you will not maybe take the time to bother and when you and you don't do enough trade with these regions then you find that people will say well even when you're trying to get language into the curriculum a lot of students are not interested because they can't readily see how it is that they will use these uh, other languages and i say many english speakers are so comfortable and I, I would say, let me just include myself. I'm not putting myself on the extreme periphery. Many, in, I see a hand up. One moment, please. I'm going to let it, that person have a chance very shortly. Yes, and I would say that it is, it is, it is a, it is a, it is a concern, really. It is. So let let us hear from the person who, who has their hand up. I'm not sure how long that hand has been up. Can we allow this person, please? Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I just want to say thanks to Mr. Okay. Wilkinson for that very thought-provoking uh, presentation. And I say thought-provoking because one of the things that jumped out at me in your presentation was when you reminded me in particular that when we speak of languages, we don't or we shouldn't just limit it to oral languages because I'm guilty, trust me, of very that. You know, when you hear the word language, you think, oh, oral language, you know, spoken. But thank you for reminding us that sign languages are equally as important as the spoken oral language. And I'm of the view, therefore, that all languages, oral or sign, play or have an in indispensable role to play in the integration of our Latin American and Caribbean peoples, and by extension, all other regions in the world. So thank you again for that riveting reminder, Ms. Wilkinson. And thank you for making me feel good. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you very much, Ms. Foster. For I really, um, okay. I'm listening to everybody and I'm thinking that the best kind of integration is the one that we don't meddle with. Um, and yet we know because of the current structure of things in the world, we, we, I mean, we don't know how many more generations are going to be born into these inequities that are now so glaring, brought out the glaring inequities are totally exposed now by the COVID-19 pandemic. So we, 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 are not, we don't seem to be anywhere near removing the inequities 
So we can't let language do what it likes. We have to enter the stage. We have to take our language policies, not the ones we inherited unspokenly from our slave master, but we have to sit and examine those language policies and keep examining what we mean by integration. What do we mean by integration? We have to keep plumbing that and then we have to make sure we listen to everybody. You see what a task it is? As we as we the saying guy in Creole is you don't done work. You just dead and left work. I don't know how many of you understand that phrase. Yes, you can't done work. You just dead and left it. Yes. So it is, yes. it is yeah. Let me say that in Jamaica. Thank you. Okay, good. So to follow up on this pastor's comment, I just want to make the point here that right here in Jamaica, I think it's this week or late last week, I saw on the evening news where we will now be having sign language experts in the police stations island-wide, which I think is a remarkable move, you know, where persons who have difficulty, of course, either speaking or hearing can go to the station and make their report because there will be a sign language expert in, in the police stations across the island to facilitate this. It was announced. This is incredible, beautiful. Yes, yes we need that. Don't overdo. <laughs> yes, I think I saw Jeanette's hand up, her oh. real hand, not her digital hand. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. I did have my real hand up. I, I don't know how to do the digital hand. Okay, great. Well, go ahead. Can I? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And, you know, thank you, Charlene, for that really um, fascinating, informative presentation. I learned a lot. And I'm wondering, colleagues, friends, if, if COVID has given us an opportunity via having to use the internet and Zoom classes and so on, you know, and I'm just imagining whether a coalition of English teachers, you know, Charlene, you said English teachers, you, you, you know, you refer to yourself as an English teacher, and I, I know some of your experience as an English teacher, whether English teach, whether teachers, teachers of language across this region could not possibly get together on the ground via Zoom, you know, and, and, and various networks and link with various language communities so that our students perhaps could get accustomed to knowing, okay, it's not just English, you know, as, um, as, you, as you said, mm -hmm. Mrs. Gooden, you know, there, there's this, you know, British English kind of bias contempt in Jamaica where, oh, if it's not English, you know, it's like, you, you're going to have to come and meet me. I'm not going to reach out and, 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 and meet you. And so I'm just imagining a, a, a generation coming out of this window that COVID has opened that maybe if children in Jamaica are linking with children in Venezuela, um, French Guyana, Guadeloupe, wherever, and just slowly, because I imagine it could be slowly, getting accustomed to the fact that here is a region with all these languages and beginning to get accustomed to the fact of this is the politics. This is the politics. This is the disruptions that have happened. Because if we start from the policy end, I just feel as if it's going to, you know, that a hundred years from now, we're going to be here saying the same things. But yeah, when, that's, when that's people dilemma. can, yeah, when people follow, connect yeah. one and one and, and get to yeah. know each other as friends, yes. as in community. Like digital, digital pen pals almost. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For, digital uh, pals, maybe. <laughs> yes. 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 Well, that, that's an idea of something we can do to uh, encourage some simple, we would say that at a quite simple level and that would be so difficult to implement to try to communicate with um, other schools and educational uh, facilities within the region at a simpler level. I know between your UA, University of the West Indies, and uh, the French Caribbean, uh, there is such a program because we've had exchanges between the regions. Monsieur Renault, 
could speak a little bit about that. Could you give us a few words about the uh, yes. exchange that has taken place? I myself have participated in exchange. That's how I was in Guadeloupe. I went on what they call a post assistant program, which is where the French students had a chance to choose whichever French territory they wanted to, to go to for a year, and they could teach English there while learning French. And also they had the opportunity of a, a part scholarship to do the master's, which is how I managed to have done my master's in political science with international relations at University of Thierry de Guayenne, with Monsieur Fredreno, who was one of my lecturers there. So, and here we are communicating yes, and operating years after. Please don't mention how many years after Monsieur Renault. I don't want persons to start adding up with their calculator to see how old I am. So could you please come in? <laughs> And, and now, now we have a new program. We call it Elan, Ilan, uh, a program of exchanges between uh, uh, universities of Caribbean. Um, students can now uh, come to, to to Guadeloupe and Martinique, and they they can have um, uh, financial possibilities to 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 to, to go to to all. Um, Anglophone territories now, uh, so it's easier. It's easier now to to um, to have a, a real cooperation between oh, uh, uh, countries of uh, OECS mm -hmm. and uh, countries of uh, of UWI, UWI and our university. Now it's possible. Oh, very. We good. have the money to do it now. <laughs> Très bien. Je suis heureuse. <laughs> yeah, d'apprendre cela. I'm very happy to learn that. Yeah, I wonder if I could jump in and ask all of us to ask ourselves, to what degree are we still the settler and to what degree are we the native? I, I got that idea from Professor Shona Jackson and another Guyanese um, recently, and I thought it was very profound. She's, it's a question she put to her African-American brothers and sisters, her African brothers and sisters, um, but we can ask, all of us can ask ourselves that question, including the people that we assume to be native. To what extent has the world economy, the systems of power, rendered us siding more with the settler or identifying more with the settler or more with the native? And to what extent do they both inhabit our own ontologies, our own individual ontologies? And what does it mean for us when we even use language or dispose ourselves to learning languages? What, what we have this, what, what um, the researchers know for sure is that every human being is born with the capacity to learn any language. But by the time you are four, and of course, by the time you reach seven for sure, you are kind of fossilized into the, the one or two or three that you will grow up with. So it, in, it's a way like the brain, the brain does that protecting mechanism, but at the same time shuts it out, shuts you out from learning other languages without sitting in a classroom. Oh. But, but, but children are born with the capacity to just absorb language and use language without being taught anything. It's like walking or breathing. Nobody teaches you how to breathe or to walk. Similarly, nobody teaches you how to speak your native languages. Think of the, think of the most, think of the absolute meaning of freedom in respect of languages. What would that mean if we were absolutely free? Oh, wow. A thousand percent free to learn, to absorb without being taught language. Can you, can you imagine? A, can you imagine the species evolving to that state? Wow. Ms. Wilkinson, I think I, I'm very happy you said ask ourselves because if we were to begin that conversation now, we would go on for another two hours. So we're asking ourselves <laughs> this question and perhaps need some time to really answer this question, you know? So it's, it, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a very important point you've made and it's something that we could reflect on. And I dare say it's a good note on which to close this program because I see where we're at 11 minutes after 11 now. 
and we had promised to be just about within an hour because once you go over an hour, you know, it gets a little difficult for persons to stay online with you. So I think that's a very good note on which to close another thought provoking sentence or uh, sentiment as well, not just sentence, but a very thought provoking sentiment to express at this moment. And I invite our, our guest here to think on these things as we usually say. All right, here we close. Thank you all for coming out. We look forward to seeing you at our other events, mainly virtual for now. And when we resume to live interaction, we hope you'll still be on board with us. Keep safe. Remember to observe the necessary protocols to protect yourself and your loved ones. And remember to be a bit selfless in your general endeavor. And try maybe, maybe it's an encouragement today for you to try to learn another language. You notice Monsieur Renault was so, uh, so what we'd say now, so gallant. He decided to just yield to us and speak in English, but because the majority of us here would speak English and it would be a little bit tricky. I could have tried to interpret for him, but I wanted to ensure that his sentiments were very clear. So I allowed him to say it himself. And thanks. Well, his English was great. Of course, course, I know it is. He was my professor, so I know. That time my French was not half as what it is today. So I know he helped us a lot with that English at the university. His English helped us a lot. So thanks for that. All right, here we are closing out our program now. Thank you very much once again. Merci beaucoup. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Lovely Thank to you. have Bye -bye. met you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Walk good. Bye. Take care, all of that. <laughs>